to have our reading from the scriptures now and rather than read Matthew 5 for a third time we're going to have a reading from the Psalms that I'm going to be referring to later and Jeff is going to read a Psalm to us now. From Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. He will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God, his saviour. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. Matthew chapter 5, verses 7 and 8 has in it the uh, fifth and sixth of the eight Beatitudes that we're looking at in this series. Matthew 5, verses 7 and 8 says this. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. In this series, we're looking at the eight Beatitudes in these uh, sayings of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5. And we're looking at, the, at them two at a time. And so today we're coming on to number five and six. Blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy and blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. Let's look at these one at a time and then I'm going to bring the two together at the end. May the Lord give us wisdom and insight as we consider his word together. Blessed are the merciful, Jesus says, for they will be shown mercy. What is mercy? Mercy is compassion for those who are in need. Mercy is bringing help and relief to those who cry out for help. The Beatitudes are about becoming more like Jesus. And in Jesus, we see a person of mercy, a merciful saviour who reflects the heart of God. And God's heart is a heart of mercy. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 27, we see two blind men crying out to Jesus and they say, Jesus, have mercy on us. Son of David, make us see. And Jesus does have mercy on them and Jesus does give them their sight. Mercy for those blind men is Jesus's compassion, but not just feelings. It's doing something about it. It's giving them the desires of their heart. They can see again because Jesus is merciful. He has compassion that is combined with practical action. Through the power of God in him, he can bring about uh, change that is coupled with compassion. He can bring about practical action, seeing, uh, giving these men sight because he has compassion and he knows it is the Father's will that they should be whole. And Jesus tells us to show mercy. Jesus tells a story, perhaps the most famous story in the Bible about being a good neighbor. He illustrates it with the Good Samaritan who shockingly, and when we lose the shock value of that story, shockingly, it's the Samaritan who turns out to be the person who has mercy. It's the, the, the Samaritan who shows compassion and turns compassion into practical action. He doesn't just say, 
oh poor man in a ditch what a shame he picks up that man and puts him onto his donkey and takes him to the the, the tavern and pays for that man to uh, be looked after until he is fully recovered the good samaritan has compassion and takes action he is a person of, of mercy and jesus says we should do likewise the world around us is unmerciful not entirely of course it's not only christians who are good or merciful but many of the people around us in the world and the, and the attitude of the world around us so often uh, seeks itself, its own good. It's self-seeking. It's often revengeful. It's often uh, only seeking for its own profit. But mercy is kindness to those who wrong us rather than seeking uh, our own good. I'm reminded of friends I had in Liverpool, a couple called Mick and Lynn, ordinary couple in church leadership, but very ordinary working class couple, um, lovely people. But, you know, you'd say unremarkable people in many ways. I hope that isn't an unkindness to them. They were thrust into the public eye, into the news in a way they would never have wanted when their son in his early 20s was attacked in the street in an unprovoked attack and killed. Their son was murdered. This couple, Christians going about a quiet, ordinary Christian life, were called upon by the media to make a statement how do you feel? I think they felt their son had been killed. They loved that boy. Of course they did. But as Christians, they decided they needed to take a stand for mercy. And they refused to call for harsh penalties against the man who killed their son. And with the full glare of the media spotlight on them, they said, God asked me to be merciful because I need mercy myself. They said, we know that God has to have mercy on every one of us. And so we need to show mercy to this man who's killed our son. Blessed are the merciful, says Jesus. We need mercy in public life. We need mercy in our politics. How often we see politics on a, an individual scale of individual politicians' actions or on big policy decisions. How often we see that being about what we can gain for us, for our party, for our, or for our nation against the rest of the world. So often in politics, all people consider is what's in it for me. Even when we vote, sometimes all we're considering is what's in it for me. But in public life, mercy thinks of all people, thinks of others before ourselves. To be merciful in public life is to say what is good for those in need, in more need than myself. There's a big debate going on in the moment. I'm going to touch on a political issue here. I hope you don't mind become, me becoming a little bit political, but I think it's an issue we will, we will agree on. It's the debate that the government that, that, that is going on at the moment about the government um, cutting the, the overseas aid budget. Uh, for years, to commend our government, for years our government has been one of the handful in the world that have lived up to the United Nations aim of giving 0.7% of national income in international aid. But now our government is cutting it from 0.7% to 0.5%. And that means billions of pounds that will not be going to people in need. And that means people will suffer and die, some of the poorest people in the world, if that decision is not reversed. And they're not even allowing a commons vote on it. And that seems to me to be an unmerciful act. And there's another question about international aid that's less often talked about. That is, 
how do we decide to use the aid that is budgeted, that is given in international aid? Too often, UK governments and other governments of richer countries have only given aid to situations where their country will benefit from it. So when we will give aid in our country, when it's attached to business interests that will benefit Britain, that people will spend the money we're giving them in aid on British goods and equipment or boost national interests, what they call soft power, which is a form of colonialism. That's not what international aid should be for. That's not merciful. That's not looking to the needs of others. Anyway, enough politics. But mercy is to be seen at the large level, what governments do, but what we can also influence, what's in our hearts. Personal mercy is doing good to those around us, being generous with our money and our time, putting the needs of others before our own needs, just the basics. But we need to be reminded of them. Blessed are the merciful. Mercy in the scriptures is linked with forgiveness. So in Matthew 6, verse 12, Jesus talks about the reciprocal nature of mercy. If we want to be forgiven, we need to forgive others. If we want others, if we want God to show us mercy, we need to be merciful to others. Jesus teaches us to pray, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And he even says, if you don't forgive others their sins, your heavenly father will not forgive your sins. How can we expect God to have mercy on us if we do not have mercy on others? And he tells a story about someone who is forgiven much and then does not forgive someone else. To be merciful is also to recognize that we ourselves are sinners who have received so much mercy. Be merciful, Jesus says. So many of these Beatitudes are rooted in the Old Testament. And one Old Testament verse that is relevant here, I could cite many more, but one well-known Old Testament verse that is certainly relevant here is Micah chapter 6, verse 8. You may know this one off by heart. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. This is what God said he requires of the people in Micah's time, and it's still true, to act with justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. How does that apply to you and to me today? How are we being like Jesus in loving mercy, in forgiving others mercifully, in loving others before we love ourselves, in showing mercy and living mercy? Lord, help us to be like this. Examine our hearts. And that brings us on to the second of these Beatitudes. Because the second of the Beatitudes is also about what's in our hearts. Blessed are the pure in heart, Jesus says. And I think this doesn't mean what it obviously means. <laughs> Uh, the purity of heart has got subtleties of meaning here. To be pure in heart, yes, is to be clean in our hearts, inside and out. Jesus often called people to live with inward purity and goodness. Uh, and certainly that's part of what this means. Jesus spoke out against the Pharisees for being like cups, which were clean on the outside, but dirty on the inside. And he said, it's no good being clean on the outside if what's inside is dirty. It's what's on the inside that matters most. And that kind of inner purity, in other words, not just looking good, but being good in our inner beings, is important. That's part of what it means to be pure of heart, pure in heart. It is. But I think Jesus is saying more than that when he says, blessed are the pure in heart. Because the word pure means more than just clean. The word pure here, I think, has uh, more of the meaning of being single-minded, having one concern, pure in the sense of being unadulterated, unalloyed, having nothing mixed in with it. 
it's more like that label that you get on orange juice that says pure orange juice. When you see something that says pure orange juice, it mean it doesn't mean it's um it's nice, it's good for you. Those things may be true, but what it means is it has no water in it, it has no sugar in it, it's just juice. Every bit of it is orange juice, comes straight from an orange. That's what it's claiming when it says pure orange juice. And so pure heart means that our hearts are 100% the Lord's, sincere hearts, 100% given over to God. And here, I think, is where that psalm that Jeff read to us, Psalm 24, comes in. Verses 3 and 4 says, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? They're thinking of the temple going into God's presence. Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. The psalmist is calling his people to worship the one God and not to stray into the worship of idols. The temptation in the age that they lived in of many competing religions and gods is to trust all of them, to hedge your bet, to cover all the bases, to say, yeah, I'll trust in God and I'll trust in, in, in this God and that God, in Baal and in all these other possible gods that they might have trusted in. But Psalm 24 says, no, uh, to use another proverb, don't put all your eggs, do put all your eggs into one basket. Some proverbs about not putting all your eggs in one basket, but this is do put all your eggs in one basket. Trust in God and God alone. The one who pleases God is the one with clean hands and a pure heart, not given to deceit. The one with a transparent life with no hypocrisy or mixed motives. And I think that's also an important part of what it means to have a pure heart. Yes, it does mean living a, a good life, but I think it's also importantly means a hundred percent life with no mixed motives. It was a basic tenet of Judaism and still is to be a true follower of God. Rule number one, Deuteronomy chapter six, verse five, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And Jesus says, this is the first and greatest commandment, and that is undivided loyalty. You can't say, I, I support one team. I, I'm a 100% I'm a Manchester United supporter, but I do like it when Manchester City win as well. 100% loyalty is saying, I just want my team to win. And having a pure heart in this sense that Jesus is saying here means being all out for our God. A pure heart is like pure metal, unadulterated, no alloys, no mixed motives. So let's just stop for a moment and say, what mixed motives might I have? Where might your faith in God be mixed up with trusting in other sources of hope or strength? Where else might you be putting your faith? I'm not saying we don't have faith in God. But Jesus is saying, maybe you're doing a this and. Maybe you're doing a this but. Maybe you're doing a this and something else. And that's not having a pure heart. Having a pure heart is saying this and this alone. Where else might you be putting your faith, your trust, your reliance, your dependence? Let's put these two Beatitudes together. Combining a pure heart with being merciful brings us back to that example I gave about countries who give foreign aid just to gain power. In other words, they're good, but they do it for their own benefit. And sometimes we can do that in a personal level. We can do what's right, but for the wrong motivation. We can say, I'll do what's good because I know I'm going to get some good out of it for me, personal benefit, personal gain, whether that's pride or whether that's some other kind of uh, respect from other people or, or benefit within the community. And Jesus says, no, act mercifully and act mercifully out of 
pure, 100% unalloyed motive. Having a pure heart is doing what's merciful for the right reason. What's in our heart is being 100% for God and not in selfish ways. Being pure in heart is helping others so that people will see us do good. And as Jesus says, we'll glorify our father in heaven, <laughs> not will glorify us. These things are not easy, are they? Just as human beings, we naturally have these mixed motives. But Jesus says only the pure in heart will see God. That's because his light drives out deceit. And in his light, we have that vision of God. So in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, John says, when Jesus appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. When we are 100% his, we shall be like him, and then we will see him. As with all these challenging sayings of Jesus, there is a challenge to examine ourselves. Not just what we do, but the motives for what we do. So we say, purify my heart, Lord. Purify my heart. Purify my actions and my deeds and my motives. That I will act mercifully with 100% motives that are pure for your glory, Lord. This is challenging stuff, but this is the life of Christ that we are called to live, to be his people, not for our glory, not for the glory of our church, please not, but for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. How are we doing that? Let's give yourself a bit of a spiritual checkup. How are you showing practical mercy? How are you doing it with a pure heart today? Let's spend a moment in prayer.